All right. Now, I would like to welcome to the show my colleague, Ian Murray, Vice President of Strategy here at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Welcome back to Free the Economy, Ian. It's great to be back on board. So uh, now, of course, Ian is our first ever returning guest on the show. Uh, we're very proud of him. Uh, frequent listeners will remember back in episode 40 when we talked about the study that he and I wrote together on the, the famous memo written by Lewis Powell in 1971. Uh, Lewis Powell later becomes Supreme Court Justice. Uh, he laid out uh, at the time what he saw as an assault on the free enterprise system in the U.S. And that uh, that memo went on to have lots of interesting uh, political and real world uh, consequences. Uh, but today we have another paper we're talking about also uh, very interesting and insightful. Uh, this time uh, that Ian wrote on his own titled A New Birth of Freedom, Free Markets, the institutions of liberty and the common good in what made you decide to write this paper and why now in 2024? Well, it's actually part of a series uh, that the Heritage Foundation has put together uh, called Conservative Conversations, I believe, uh, which is uh, various uh, different authors from various different parts of the conservative movement uh, giving their uh their, their interpretation of what the current talk about uh, the common good means for the conservative movement. So I thought that it, it, it would be a, a, a very good thing to put together uh, a piece that uh, essentially argues that in the American context, uh, the institutions of liberty form the common good that we should be aiming for. Yeah, and of course, it's uh, it's no surprise to anyone that in the the sort of what you call the conservative movement or the right of center movement, um, center right world, uh, in the past uh, few years, several years at this point, there have uh, been um, you know some significant disagreements about whether you would call yourself a traditional conservative, a Reaganite conservative, or uh, some you know these days the, a populist conservative or a nationalist conservative. And so the idea of what this sort of like the right half of the political spectrum uh, means and what do people uh, what do people think what do people in that part of the spectrum uh, think about various big issues has been uh, somewhat more in, in dispute than maybe it was in, in previous decades so uh, it's interesting that a big a big player uh, in the space like like the Heritage Foundation um, have decided to do sort of multiple perspectives on this um, but can you go into the difference between uh, in more detail about uh, talking about the common good as, like you said, like a set of um, institutions and, uh, you know, the rights that, that uh, uh, undergird them, as opposed to a specific set of, like, policy outcomes is is the common yeah, good. The, yeah, the, the, the common good has, uh, at least in recent decades, I, uh, conservatives like Michael Novak uh, uh, wrote about it, but the common good has been tended to be associated with uh, the centre and centre left, uh, and not with the, uh, the, the 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 conservative movement in politics. Uh, you see, you know, Robert Reich wrote a book in twenty nineteen, I think, you know, entitled "Common Good." But uh, Senator Marco Rubio and others have reintroduced the, the the concept of the common good into the conservative dialogue, and. Very often, this means uh, that this has been used to try to introduce uh, the concepts like uh, Catholic social uh, teaching into the uh, in, 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 into the dialogue uh, that, that the conservatives have. Um, my worry about introducing any sort of explicitly religious. Uh, concept of the common good is that it that that is actually exactly what the founders were very wary of and when you look at the preamble to the constitution uh it talks about ensuring domestic tranquility uh the the, the, the philosophers of, of, of the 17th and 18th century contrasted the the, the the common good the summum bonum with the summum malum the summum malum the greatest evil which was civil war and I think the founders, in, in putting the Constitution together, wanted a world in which uh, different concepts of the, uh, of, of the common good could flourish in different communities. And there, but there wouldn't be an attempt to impose one particular 
way of thinking uh, as this is the only right way to live uh, on, on the United States uh, as a whole. So ensuring domestic tranquility was, uh, was, was foremost in their thoughts. They wanted a world where the Amish and the hippie could be friends. <laughs> and, you know, so it's, it's interesting that, like you said, a lot of, uh, a lot of people who talk about uh, the common good as opposed to a, a sort of uh, specific kind of greedy thing that's just good for yourself, that's more traditionally more of a left of center thing um, that uh, a more sort of communitarian that you should, everyone should share equally and that, you know, um, you shouldn't do things just to benefit yourself or your family or your you know, industry or whatever, uh, that there should be a sort of, uh, you know, in, in the, the political application of that, uh, I mean, that's sort of a, a general ethical way of looking at it, but the political application of that is that there should be more communitarianism. There should be, say, like higher tax rates, for example, there should be mm -hmm. fewer or less income inequality and things like that. So um, I think I definitely agree. It's sort of it's it's an odd sort of pivot to have real kind of more traditionalist conservatives using that that same language. And and I wonder if if you think the sort of advocates of sort of common good conservatism today whether uh, they're actually inspired in part by some of the sort of like left-wing communitarianism, like it's just better for everyone to be more equal, period? Uh, or or do they think that they've just gotten enough of a political advantage right now that they can force everyone to agree with them on, you know, force everyone to accept their version of what they think the common good should be? I, I think it, it it comes from from, from a good place. I, I I think there's a feeling, uh, and and we we, we can discuss this uh, later. But there's there's a feeling that something has gone wrong uh, in America, and that people are hurting or aimless or drifting, and they need uh, a, a, a sort of sense of purpose uh, that that uh, that modern America does not survive and. Often the diagnosis uh, for this from people who talk about the common good in the conservative context is that free markets, or as they sometimes use the, the term disparagingly, market fundamentalism, uh, has led to a sort of hollowing out of uh, American community. And they see that uh, uh, the, the, well, the, the, their prescription for, the, for this diagnosis is to uh, introduce this concept of the common good into the uh, the political system uh, to try to reinst reinstate uh, some of that sense of, of of community and belonging and togetherness that uh, that they feel uh, uh, markets have, have have attacked. Yeah, and the the idea that they're there's something. There's a, we had a we had a good system before, but something has has has, has gone wrong with that. I think is is pretty strong. Um, you know the. I feel like some of the populist, you know, or sort of common good conservative critics, uh, you know, they wouldn't say that there's anything inherently wrong with the American system. You know, the way like a socialist would say, we should, you know, we shouldn't have the constitution we have now. We shouldn't have competitive markets. We shouldn't have any of that stuff. We should have a totally different system. Um, they wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, but that you know there was there was a good American system and it worked for a long time, but now it's it it's been ruined or it's broken and it's not working. Um, and there, but there seems to also be differing uh, differing opinions on a what went wrong, or b when when did things start going wrong? Um, there's you know a, a sort of a a meme. It's a Twitter uh, a Twitter account. It's a website called What the F Happened in 1971. <laughs> Where uh, uh, and that's just one example. Um, people, uh, you know, talking about specifically about the economy, not so much sort of like social policy in America, but about the economy. People, some people don't think it was good for Nixon to take the uh, U.S. dollar off the gold standard. All sorts of, you know, uh, there's all sorts of particular arguments about why any particular year is a is a is a point at which things started going bad. But um, from your, you know, you obviously read read a lot about this and read a lot of this, you know, the people out there who are you know critics like this what are the either the specific changes or the, the years or what are the pivot points where someone said ah everything was actually pretty good in america until 1964 or 1971 or 1983 or the year nafta was signed or you know what are the what are the options we had, we've got for when things went bad 
Yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's a moving target. Uh, as you say, 1971 is uh, is is often used. Uh, you know, we talked about the, the the threats that were facing America in 1971 in our discussion on on on, on the Powell memo. Um, but often it's uh, the Reagan years. Uh, there's a feeling that uh, that that everything everything was fine, and then uh, we we we. Uh, we walked back sensible laws on antitrust and regulation and so on, and uh, the, the the Reagan years uh, set in process this um, uh, the, 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 this uh, decline. Sometimes it is uh, the Clinton years. Sometimes it's NAFTA, as you as 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 you suggest, and and the idea that it, it trade is at the set free trade is at the center of this uh, of this decline. Other times it's the Bush years, uh, and uh, the the the, the uh, the feeling that when the neoconservatives got into power under Bush, that that's when uh, that that that's when everything went wrong. So th there are a lot of varying uh, th varying uh, designations uh, of, of of exactly when it all started, but they all have this uh, the, 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 this same thing in common that there has been a decline over at least the last twenty years, uh, possibly longer, and that uh, and that. Uh, uh, previous versions of conservative policy, previous uh, paradigms of con conservative policy, uh, have been responsible for that decline. Yeah, and you know, so there's a lot of debate about, you know, trade policy and uh, becoming, you know, the the U.S. supporting China becoming part of the World Trade Organization in 2000 and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I feel like a lot of those changes that some people you know blame american job losses on were things that were going to happen anyway they might have happened exactly the same way if we had made different choices about say like wto policy but the the global economy was going to change china's economy was always going to change it was never going to remain the same and some of for example the manufacturing sector's advantages after world war ii when most of the rest of the industrial world was bombed out <laughs> during world war ii like those were never going to be permanent advantages anyway uh countries like china were always going to develop and the most reasonable way for them to develop was to to leverage up from being a mostly agricultural uh country to to being at first the you know the low-cost uh you know manufacturing industrial development country so uh, there were there were causes and effects I don't think we could have gone back in time and said, uh, we're going to be anti-China and that way, and that will save all the Detroit manufacturing jobs. Because, you know, especially when people say, oh, well, things started going bad in 2000 or in 19, you know, uh, 90, 92, 94, the, the NAFTA era. If you look at the history of, again, a place like Detroit, you know, this was the powerhouse of America with the big three automakers, lots of, lots of good, you know, union jobs with pensions, uh, the population of Detroit peaked in 1960 and started declining after that. It's a slow decline at first, but you know, people were talking about Rust Belt politics at first. I think they started to people called it the Rust Bowl because that made people think about the Dust Bowl. Uh, but people were talking about Rust Belt politics in like the early 1980s. Right? This is way before NAFTA and definitely before China ceded to the WTO. Um, right. Detroit's, Detroit has been in decline since 1960, not 1995 or 2000. So, uh, you know, this is, that's, you know, part of my, my theory about this is that it's, it's not that there weren't industrial dislocations in the heartland of America, but, but I wonder, even if you had gone back in time with the sort of populist economics of today, what could we have done? What could political leaders 30, 40 years ago have done to have stopped that, if anything? Well, the, the, there's a chart in my uh, in, in my paper of uh, the the, uh, the decline in uh, manufacturing as a share of total employment in, in, in the US. And if any of these diagnoses were, were correct, you, you, you would expect to see uh, pretty steady employment up until uh, 1971 or 1984 or uh, 94 or 2000 whenever and and then for it all to start declining that's just not the case the manufacturing as a share of total employment in in, in the uh, US 
has been declining steadily since the mid-1950s. And uh, you know there, there is no one point you can you 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 can uh, you you can locate on on the graph uh, when uh, it, it it all started and uh, equate that to, uh, to 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 neoliberal if you want to use that term policies uh, you you just can't see it and at the same time manufacturing product uh, uh, the sorry the amount that we actually produce manufacturing has been going up. Constantly up until uh, up, up until around 2012, when when, when it started uh, to to level off, yeah. So so when, if they say we don't make th things in America anymore, we, we do. We make plenty of things in America. We make more things in America now than at any any point in our in our history. It's just not a significant uh, a, a contributor to uh, to employment anymore. Uh, the, 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 there is actually a very interesting paper, uh, which I think does a better uh, better job of locating uh, you know, wh wh why the Rust Belt in particular uh, suffered uh, a, a loss of manufacturing jobs. And that, 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 uh, that, that, that paper really pins the blame on union activity uh, and strikes in particular. In, uh, in 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 what is now the Rust Belt between 1950 and 1980, and I think that does a better job of uh, of, of explaining just what went on in our manufacturing heartlands uh, than any of the uh, uh, any uh, any of the, uh, the the papers of blame, say the China shock. Well, yeah, and so we have a couple effects here. You have, you know, the Increasing industrial production in the United States, even as the percentage of workers who work in manufacturing has has declined, declined significantly. Um, that is that is a success story. That's an amazing success story because it means every person who is doing uh, doing one of those jobs is doing the jobs of two or three or four people who were doing sixty years ago. They're more productive, producing more stuff. Um, and I, you know, I, I use this example all the time. I'm sure I mentioned it before on the show that uh, you know. If you go back to the founding of the country, say, take take a, a round number about, you know, 1800, a young republic, 90 uh, percent of Americans worked on farms. Yeah. Right. And now it's less than five percent. It's you know, depending on how you define it, it's maybe you know, two or three percent. Um, does that mean we've we've lost millions of farming jobs? Where did all those good farming jobs go? Right. All those people, they they worked on a farm and they they got married and they raised children and their children went on to become farmers. You know, where did the millions of farming jobs go? Well, <laughs> farming became massively more efficient in uh over you know 200 plus years uh and so one farmer can feed you know 10 20 times as many people as uh as they could back then so that opened up the opportunity for uh where almost everyone who didn't come from a wealthy family uh, had to be a farmer now to do literally anything else and and, and when we can see changes in population and land use and migration when people have a chance to leave the farm and move someplace else and do something that's not farming, a lot of people take that chance. I would say a lot of human history is simply the history of people not wanting to be farmers anymore. Um, and moving to uh, places where there's more opportunity, where they just have more options in general. No no dig on people who are farmers. Uh, I'm very glad the people who are still farming are doing that, but it's good to have options. And most people in 1800 did not have the option of not being a farmer. Well, the, 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 this is exactly it. So the, what, one of the things that the, um, uh, the, 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 the the critics of the declining share of manufacturing employment uh, the, the often suggest is that uh, the, 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 these, the, the people who've lost manufacturing jobs uh, couldn't find good, fulfilling work. Uh, they were forced to take you know, jobs flipping burgers or something uh and uh, you know they they, they have a uh their incomes significantly uh, uh decreased as as a result of this decline in manufacturing as a percentage of employment but again when you when you actually look at the data that, that's not the case only if, uh, they didn't go to become burger flippers uh, only four percent of people who lost manufacturing jobs uh you know, were in the food service industry Generally speaking, they either found jobs in other manufacturing or they actually moved into uh, office or other uh, other, other similar uh, jobs that 
actually paid significantly more than the manufacturing jobs uh, that, 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 that were replaced. And, that, and that's part, exactly as you say, is part of the process of, uh, you know, of, of, of greater efficiency. We do free up people. And people, as Julian Simon, our great icon here at CEI, always say people are the ultimate resource. Uh, so the, 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 um, allowing people to do different things, uh, allowing them to exploit their own potential uh, is 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 generally a very good thing, and that's that that that's what we find. Uh, the uh, people find more fulfilling jobs, and uh, they uh, the, what comes with those more fulfilling jobs is uh, you know a, a higher standard of living, a higher standard of living for everybody as a result, and that's absolutely a good thing, and we should not be afraid to say so. Well, I think it's also kind of funny, the cultural attitude towards certain categories of jobs and how much that has changed. I think if you went back in the 50s and 60s, the people who were writing, you know, think pieces, the newspaper op-eds and, you know, uh, pundits and researchers and the kind of people who are, you know, the public intellectual types, they would have said, our problem in this country is that we're too regimented, we're too centralized. People have, uh, they're just cogs in a big machine. They have these boring, unfulfilling jobs. If you had gone back to the time that supposedly is the industrial golden age of America and said that, you know, the great jobs that we want to protect are working as a factory worker on an assembly line, they would have looked at you like you had lost your mind because that was actually the sin qua non of the worst kind of the worst dehumanizing, just an empty headed, you know, not not original, not creative kind of job that that we, we supposedly we want to get rid of. Right. We want to have more originality, we want creativity, we want flexibility. We want all the things that you get with like the gig economy now. Right. With, you know, uh, you know, technology platforms and things um, like if, you know, if someone in 1960 was, you know, holding a symposium on the future of work. Like we're living their 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 dream future, right? The meme you maybe you've seen with like the city that looks very, you know, very futuristic and streamlined. You know, people say like, oh, if we had just done the right thing, this would be the future today. You know, it looks like a, a sci-fi uh, paradise. Uh, like we're we're living in that right now. But now somehow we've come, you know, all the way around the other side, and now we're sort of glorifying uh, that that exact sort of. Uh, repetitive, non-creative, organizational cog in a machine work, um, which it just it 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 sort of blows my mind. Um, but there's a sort of like weird nostalgia that I think people from that era would find strange. Oh yeah, I, it, 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 w w w when I was growing up, one of the great classics of of, uh, of, of cinema was re uh, regarded as Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. Uh, and in that, Charlie Chaplin becomes a factory worker and um, he, he struggles to keep up. It's hard work. And then eventually he gets sucked into this, actually sucked into the machine, which is, of course, a, an allegory. But uh, the, 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 uh, what, what we forget about the, the, these, these jobs was that they weren't uh, fulfilling. They weren't, uh, uh, they weren't conducive to good mental health. And nor were they conducive to physical health. Uh, the, the, uh, these manufacturing jobs were extremely dangerous. So uh, similarly, extractive uh, uh, jobs, mining, and so on. I mean, my my grandfather was a coal miner. Uh, talk to any of the, uh, the of the, the the people who talk about the common good, and and they'll say yes, coal mining was noble work. Well, it is absolutely, I completely agree. Coal mining was very much noble work, but it killed my grandfather. You know, he died from black lung disease. I, you know, I saw him wither away before uh, before my eyes. You know, th th this sort of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, valorizing of, uh, of of jobs that 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 were dangerous to the extent that they that they could kill you is is I think uh, a, a mistake. And throughout history, we've regarded uh, it as a mistake. We should always be looking to try and get people, move people from dangerous occupations to uh, safer occupations. And if moving from dangerous occupations to safer occupations actually comes with a, a significant pay rise, then that's a win-win all around, I think.
Well, yes. And, you know, one of the, the section headers in your paper, I think, is is it's short, but it's kind of a pretty evocative. It, it reads, why are people unhappy? Uh, which seems like a very a very broad <laughs> question to be asking, but it's, you know, certainly relevant here to, to, to questions of like, what economic policy should we have? What workforce policy should we have? Um, you know, if you if you look at like we've been talking about all these sort of statistics about what you know, how has the average wage been rising? Yes, you know, is per capita GDP been rising? Yes, um, you know, health outcomes, with perhaps some exception of the past few years, in general over the long term have been rising. We've had lots of very positive trends that are economic trends, social trends, and and you can point all these things out, but then. You know the the critics of the current system will say, say well but we still we still don't like it we're still not happy it's we're not fulfilled it's not it's not good for us um is there i mean there's nothing wrong with being being ill at ease with modernity lots of people are ill at ease within modern society but is there a public policy solution to that do people say like well i don't like contemporary american society the vibes are off i feel gross like what what can we what law can you pass to fix that well, I think you 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 have to look at you know and this was the, the point of that section that you uh, that, 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 that that you mentioned. You really have to look at what actually are the uh, the, the the sources of this uh, unhappiness that uh, that that conservatives uh, you know feel particularly uh, sensitive about, and, and and when you look at it, uh, it's almost always uh, the result of government interference in uh, the, the, a free society. Um, what One of the things uh, that, that, that I look at is the collapse, well, uh, perhaps collapse is, a, is, is too strong a point, but the, 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 there's a crisis in American dynamism. Uh, what do I mean by that? Dynamism is a process by which People uh, are able to switch jobs, you know, from the unfulfilling job to the more fulfilling job. Get the uh, get the pay rise, um, and, uh, or to move uh, around the country uh, in order to find that uh, more fulfilling job, uh, a higher paying job. Um, that those. Uh, those indicators are, have been on a downward trend, uh, you know, for, for for at least a couple of decades, uh, and they're 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 very much associated with the rate of new form of new firm formation within the within the United States. At one point uh, in in the, in the last decade, more firms were uh, were dying uh, than were being created, which is very much not the historical norm. Historically, the um, Far more new firms have been created than old, old ones dying, and that provides the opportunity. That's where that, that's how people switch uh, switch their jobs. That's you know, the, uh, firms may die in one part of the country, but may uh, uh, may open up in another part of the country. So you, not everybody it's it's not for everybody, but some people will switch uh, switch their location uh, to, to to get that better job, and that frees up jobs uh, in the. Uh, in the place where they leave, so all of these put together uh, are, uh, you know, a, a, a very healthy indicators of uh, a, a, of a society when when those trends are positive, but they be negative. And when you look at it, in all probability, the the, the reason why those new firms aren't being created, why people uh, aren't able to switch job, why they find themselves stuck in place. Uh, the reason for that is government regulation. Uh, government regulation makes it much harder to start a, a, a firm now than, than, than it used to be. Um, government regulation might actually uh, uh, force you to stay to stay in place. Say you've got uh, 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 an occupational license uh, that, that's valid in your state, but valid but isn't valid in another. You 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 can't move. Uh, welfare also has uh, a, a, a significant um, uh, effect here, and you know the the, the work of uh, Nick Eberstadt at at, at AEI, uh, 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 who's who's written a, a book about men uh, called Men Without Jobs, uh, is uh, you know I think that's really uh, really important uh, to think about what the, the sort of deterrent effect 
of welfare policy is. So there's all these uh, regulatory systems uh, and uh, disincentives in, in place that are that, that are causing this gumming up of the American system and causing a lot of people to feel unhappy. Yeah, and one, you know, one of the things, you know, that you mentioned in your paper and you sort of, you know, sort of hinted at that uh, response is that uh, one of the big critiques from the populace is that, you know, there's a certain subset of young men in particular that are are not flourishing they're not getting good jobs but that also means they're also not starting families and these are guys in their 20s or early 30s you know they're uh they're not disabled they're certainly not fully disabled uh but they aren't working and they're not actively looking for work but because they're and this is sort of where statistics can mislead by a mission <laughs> i think is that uh if you're not actively looking for work you're not counted in the unemployment numbers yeah. right unemployment is only for people who don't have a job but are looking for one and so if if you tell this you know the the survey taker that you're not looking for work then you don't you don't get counted in there so there's this sort of unseen layer of of, of people at the at the at the bottom generally at the bottom of the economic ladder in general uh but that um if you're not participating in the labor force, then you don't get counted in unemployment. So that so when you see the unemployment levels are there at you know six percent or they're at five percent or they're four point five percent, that's not the whole picture because there's other people who who aren't in there, but who normally and this is again Nick Nick Everstadt's point historically a lot of these young men would have been in the labor force, but they have sort of dropped out right. That that number has rebounded a little bit in just in the past few years, but if you zoom out and you look at the last fifty or sixty years, there's there's way more of these guys who could be doing work, and just aren't, and so they're and they're not in school, they're not in vocational training, they're just they're playing video games, they're on TikTok, um, and they really are. There there's survey data that shows, in fact, that's the way they spend most of their day. That's that's real. Um, that's not just glib. And and so they are sort of the 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 Ruba Kali, right? They're the missing quadrant of, you know, they're not 25%, but they're, they're less than that, but they're like the missing section that we kind of don't see because they don't show up in other numbers. And, you know, uh, Nick has his own theories and you've sort of kind of hinted at some of them. Uh, one, which is that social welfare policy that was meant to help like the, you know, what I call the truly needy has sort of, uh, trapped these guys who can get just just barely get by by cobbling together some like benefits and then you know maybe maybe their family maybe their girlfriend maybe who who else is like helping them along um, but because of that they they never kind of reach escape velocity so they never get their first job which means they never get their second job which means they never make enough money to support a family and then you have the the long term con conservative critique for decades which is a person with no useful work and therefore a person who doesn't get involved in family formation is not going to have a great life in general. Yeah, I, the, 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 this, the, this is uh, precisely it. I mean, the, 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 the rise of the NILF, not in labor force or, or NEAT, not in uh, education, employment or training. Um, the, the, this has been the great hidden, uh, uh, hidden problem in American society. Um, I, th I think Nick does a, a, a great job of, uh, of talking about that. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a welfare expert myself, but it seems clear that, the, uh, that, 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 that there are significant uh, negative effects from welfare policy as it is currently, uh, uh, currently implemented in, in America. Yeah, and I think there are two things that, that, that suggest that this is a purely American problem. The first is that you don't see this uh, the, 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 this uh, lack of engagement by prime age working men uh, in immigrants, and that's because immigrants generally are not uh, eligible for these welfare programs. Secondly, you don't see this. You, know, the, you see similar sort of problems with manufacturing and, and things like that across the Western world. You don't see this uh, the, the, this this NILF problem among prime age working men uh, in other parts of the Western world. Uh, the, 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 
we're, we're often uh, we often say that uh, that, that uh, Europe has much more generous uh, social welfare programs uh, than America. Yes, ex but there are exceptions, uh, and one exception is the extremely generous disability uh, 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 programs uh, that America has. And it seems to me that Nick has conclusively demonstrated that it's those disability uh, programs that are, that, are, that are driving this disengagement of a large segment of prime age working men uh, from useful and fulfilling work. And for people who are not, they don't meet the definition of what most people would think of someone who is like fully disabled, completely unable to work. Absolutely, yes. And and so when it, you know when it comes to well what do we you know what do we do about this the 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 solutions uh, part um you know i think one thing again your paper covers on a topic that we've talked about before which is sometimes that the best solution to a whole range of problems isn't detailed plans for each specific problem it's big picture things like rolling back government burdens and limitations in general and for example you know more economic growth and an expanding economy it's the more wage growth. It lifts everyone's boats and solves lots of specific problems, right? Yes. But it's but it's not a how do we solve the problem of a displaced worker in a coal town in a specific area, right? It's just we need a more robust economy with more economic growth in general. Um, but that's for some people that's like not the sexy solution. That's not the sort of emotionally satisfying solution, right? They sort of want a program where the government is going to fund someone to like hold the hand of every displaced coal worker and sit with them while they revise their resume. Um, maybe that's not actually what we need. Um, so, you know, some of these can be kind of specific, like you talked about occupational licensing, like if you have a if you have a job and you have a state license and it only works in that state and you'd have to do a bunch of BS in another state to be able to keep doing that job. Occupational licensing reform. OK, well, that's maybe that's more specific. That's not just economic growth in general, but but a lot of these sort of discontents and people who are stuck between one industry declining and another one, hopefully, you know, in increasing in the future, um, more economic growth would do that. Right. So. Maybe less regulation, <laughs> lower taxes, especially like things on long-term investment um, and you know productive capacity. Um, what do you you know? What do you think about the sort of like just the free market prescription in general for a growing economy versus well, maybe we do need tailored programs for some of these issues. Yeah, I mean the the trouble with those tailored programs is that, that generally speaking they just don't work. Um, you know, trade adjustment assistance. It's in every single. Uh, uh, law authorizing a, a, a free trade ag uh, agreement. Um, you know, the idea is that if you lose your uh, job, uh, uh, thanks to foreign trade, you get tax breaks and training allowances and uh, and, and all sorts of handouts uh, to, to, to help you adjust. And every analysis of trade adjustment assistance programs shows they just don't work. Uh, re retraining, reskilling programs—they they have a history of, uh, of 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 aiming at the wrong skills. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I forget the, the the name of the actual town, but there, there, there was a town in Ohio that uh, wanted to help uh, you know former manufacturing or extractive industry workers uh, uh, learn to code. You know, the classic uh, the, the, the the you know the classic answer: learn to code. They they, they they taught them in a, a, a coding language that uh, was obsolete obsolete by the time that they had finished their their, their their retraining. Examples like this just pile up time after time after time. And although you know things like occupational licensing reform are probably about as uh, as as targeted uh, as you get and still be effective. Overall, the 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 answer has to be to free up. Uh, the genius of the American people uh, within a uh, within a free economy uh, to to let them solve their own problems, and that whenever that's been tried, it works. Look at what's happening in Argentina at the moment. Uh, Javier Malay has introduced some significant deregulation of various sectors uh, 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 of of the economy. It's real shock treatment uh, of the sort that we're told would 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 be absolutely terrible, and 
things are things are, are turning around extremely quickly. Uh, rent control, for instance, uh, has been uh, uh, released in Argentina, and all of a sudden, not only has the supply of uh, of, of of new uh, of, of accommodation. Uh, increased dramatically, but rents have also dropped. Exactly the opposite of what uh, what, what people said would happen if, if when you deregulated shock treatment. Uh, sometimes uh, sometimes works, and it tends to work a lot better than targeted programs. Ah, so it's so it's true. You don't have to teach the grass to grow, but you do have to move the rocks off the lawn. Somebody should uh, somebody should uh, put that on a t shirt. Right? <laughs> so my, my favorite phrase. You've all heard it before. Um, so, uh, this is uh, this is a fascinating analysis, and uh, I, I, for one, uh, commend the uh, the Heritage Foundation for for publishing this because even though they they say, of course, these are these these different papers in this series don't necessarily reflect the institutional view of the Heritage Foundation, but because there is so f much ferment and uh, uh, debate about this, um, I think it's uh, extraordinarily. Uh, 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 smart move by them to to be uh, fostering this debate, um, even while we know I'm sure there are plenty. They have plenty of heritage fans who would, who would disagree with the analysis and have a more uh, populist view. But um, we're glad this debate is happening. So uh, before we go, uh, Ian, again, thanks for being our first ever return guest. I will I will get you your return guest crown soon. Um, tell us where where do we find this paper? Where do we find you? Obviously, you're on social media. How do we consume all of your stuff? Yes, uh, the, the, the paper is available at heritage.org. Uh, uh, the, the, there's also a link to it. Uh, I, I, um, I, I put a summary of the paper on our blog at cei.org slash blog. Uh, I'm on uh, social media, especially X, uh, at, uh, at i s. M U R R A Y at I S Murray. All right, I'm gonna. I'm always gonna call it Twitter forever. You, <laughs> I'm gonna we, get with you the won't, program. <laughs> you won't. You won't. You won't X me out. Um. All right. Uh. Again, thank you so much for being with us, Ian. And uh, we'll see you. Maybe. Maybe you'll be the third time guest. I stand ready to serve.